Although fighting techniques go far back into ancient history, it was the Indian monk, Bodhidharma, who organized the first formal system of martial training. The year was 525 AD. From those humble beginnings in the Shaolin Temple in China, the martial arts spread throughout the Asian world. Because communication was slow or even non-existent between countries in those times, each country, in fact each village, formulated its own style of fighting art. In Japan, the samurai developed warrior arts based mostly on the sword. The peasant classes of Okinawa concentrated on empty-handed arts. In Korea, the Warang warriors, a group similar to the samurai, developed an unarmed fighting art over 300 years ago. Korea eventually became less warlike, and the fighting arts declined in popularity and at one point were actually outlawed and survived only by going underground and being passed along in secrecy. In 1910, Japan overran Korea and instituted martial law. Many Koreans sought better opportunities in China and even in Japan itself. There they were exposed to other fighting arts such as Chinese Kung Fu and Japanese Jiu Jitsu or Karate. The end of World War II brought stability back to the Far East. Korea was liberated from Japanese oppression and thousands came back home to openly practice both the traditional Korean arts as well as the other Asian systems. In 1956, a young third degree black belt named Jun Ri arrived in Texas and introduced America to the Korean martial arts. He taught a martial arts style called Tang Su Do, or Way of the China Hand. But since no one in this country had ever heard of Tang Su Do, or any of the other Korean martial arts for that matter, Ri used the more well known Japanese term, Karate. Interestingly, the original translation of Karate was also China Hand, but in order to be more accepted into Japanese society, the translation was changed to Empty Hand. The other Koreans coming into the United States in the 50s and 60s also continued to use the name Karate for their schools. But meanwhile, back in Korea, the various schools decided to unite under a new name, Taekwondo, or Way of Kicking and Punching. The actual vote to change the name came in 1955, but it would be years before most of the Koreans decided to accept that name, and in fact, some of them did not. The die had also been set in the minds of most American practitioners, and they continued to use the word karate as a generic term. In fact, many American instructors even use a combination of Japanese and Korean terminology in their classroom, a practice actually quite natural for Americans who tend to combine techniques as well as terminology. And remember, that practice was actually started by the Koreans who came to this country in the 50s and 60s. 10th degree black belt Grandmaster Jun Ri is known as the father of American Taekwondo. I started my Taekwondo when I was 13 years old in Cheongdo-gwan, which is one of the uh, uh, about five or six different uh, studios in Taekwondo. And uh, I came to the United States in 1956 and <coughs> uh, as a Korean Army officer uh, where I stationed, uh, in, I stationed in uh, San Marcos, Texas, Gary Air Force Base in San Marcos, Texas. And then uh, two years and a half later, I went to University of Texas where I started a club there where Alan Steen started uh, in, when he was a freshman in college where we became classmate and he became my student. And uh, in fact, uh, the Texas martial arts it really spread through Alan Steen. Uh, I, I would say almost 90% uh, of the martial arts in Texas uh, came from, uh, the, the, from Alan Steen, Pat Burson, and Skipper Mullen, and all this in all timer. Alan Steen was the first American June Ri promoted to black belt in the United States. In 1959, uh, I was at the University of Texas, and June Ri had uh, enrolled there, and uh, gave a big demonstration over at the Student Union Building. And uh, since I had boxed a little bit up to that point, I went to see it. And. Uh, uh, at the end of the demonstration, they passed around a, uh, an enrollment form, and uh, I think 184 of us enrolled in karate at the time. Well, actually, it was a karate demonstration, and uh, we referred to it as karate, and, 
And later on, we found out that uh, we were actually studying Taekwondo. It was that time we called it Tangsudo. Uh, everybody called it Tangsudo then. And there are some still Tangsudo associations. Uh, everybody used to call Tangsudo. And then with the Taekwondo, they changed the Taekwondo in 19, I think 1950, 1960, or sometime uh, General Che. Uh, uh, made the name Taekwondo and President Sigmund V uh, approved it, so that's Taekwondo became into picture. Taekwondo is really uh, is phonetically uh, similar to Taekyun, which is a, tr a traditional Korean martial art uh, before Japanese occupation. And so Taekwondo and Taekyun uh, are the two different uh, the word, but then that is phonetically similar, so they uh, I think I uh, accepted the Taekwondo. Ta means uh, it's stomping or kicking. Kwan means punching or fist. And Do means way. And so it's uh, literally uh, the way of punching and kicking. When we first came, karate word was known to the public. But then when we say that time, Taekwondo, uh, they thought that was a restaurant. <laughs> you see? So uh, in order to identify the similar thing that we can uh, find this, the attack uh, karate. So, Junri karate, Junri taekwondo. We used, uh, you know, karate name until uh, the public come to my studio. Once they come to my studio, now it's a taekwondo. The Koreans use some Japanese terms and some uh, Korean terms. Uh, the first big Korean tournament in the United States was the National Karate Championships, and it was sponsored by Junri, a Korean. And, uh, there are, most of the Korean tournaments were called uh, such and such karate tournament, not taekwondo tournament. Pat Burleson earned his black belt from June Rhee only a few months after Alan Steen. Like Mr. Rhee and Mr. Steen, he is also considered a pioneer of American martial arts. My first exposure in the martial arts was in Iwakuni, Japan in the mid-50s. I was all over Indochina. I had some other system exposures from Bondo and uh, Thai, but basically the Japanese system was the most organized. That's what I brought back to the United States with me. Taekwondo was unheard of. Uh, the Korean martial arts were, were very obscure. The, any, any exposure the Americans had to karate, it was, uh, karate was generic for it. Uh, I've always used the international terminology, which is uh, karate, K-R-A-T-E. Uh, even from the, uh, I had a lot of pressure originally because uh, June Rhee did accept me in the ranking system and he was the foremost uh, uh, father of uh, American Taekwondo in the United States and he pressured me to use the name Taekwondo. I, I kind of uh, went along not to, not to hurt his feelings and out of respect for him, which I had then and still do today. But I've always used karate. That's, that's been my logo from the word go. Alan Steen was the man who opened the first karate school in Texas. And within a few years, he and his band of black belt instructors had built a network of schools across the Southwest. Well, when I left the University of Texas, uh, I decided to uh, open a karate school just to see if it would go over. Of course, there were no karate schools. So uh, uh, this was in 1962, and uh, uh, we got a small place over in Snyder Plaza here in Dallas, and I ran a little two-inch high ad in the uh, Sunday paper, and I had 300 people come over that next week and enroll. As most people have never heard of karate, and so you had to run pictures of people doing kicks uh, so they could identify karate with self-defense. Steen, Burleson, and the other early instructors of American karate took bits and pieces of many different styles and molded them into a uniquely American system of martial art. Although the Asians did not like to borrow techniques from other styles, Americans were quick to do so if they found it worked. Alan Steen illustrates this point with a true story. 
I was a young black belt. And we traveled to Washington, D.C. to Mr. E's first tournament, which was won by Pat Burleson. And uh, the Mr. E had always told me that you couldn't uh, use the inside of your hand because it was too tender. You'd break a bone if you hit somebody with it, break one of your bones. And uh, so I taught my students never to hit with the inside of their hand. And uh, it was against Sergeant Herbert Peters, who was Mike Stone's instructor, uh, that I learned about the ridge hand. Because uh, I waded into him, and he waded into me, and the next thing I knew, I was unconscious. And when I woke up, I asked everybody, what did he hit me with? And uh, they said, a ridge hand. And so I went to Herbert Peters and said, show me how you hold your hand. And for the next month, I hit the bag back in Dallas with ridge hands until I found out just exactly how he did that. And we had that in our system from that point on. I think American karate has done more to evolve karate as a whole than each uh, contributing art. In other words, we've borrowed from the Kempo people, we've borrowed from the Shotokan people, we've borrowed from the Kung Fu people, Kojuru. Uh, we've borrowed from all the different systems, and this has formed what you see in tournaments today, American karate. Not only did the Asians not accept techniques from other styles, but some say they didn't accept American martial artists as equals. America was a land of milk and honey, so Asian martial art teachers came over here and uh, did quite well. But what they didn't do was make a fairness of, uh, of, of the people that uh, started coming up and gaining recognition and everything. Uh, they were always kind of second-class black belts. And uh, so I always thought that was kind of odd that there wasn't uh, more of an embracing the art and talent that was developed over here. And even there was a competitiveness because uh, the original teachers of martial arts in the United States and actually opening up were Americans, American servicemen back through World War II, through the Korean War, and uh, later on through Vietnam and all their Asian exposure, the Americans came back and really started the strong movements. The Asians just came over and joined in on it. So there's, from, there's been, I think, probably from a competitive standpoint, even back when it was formed 25, 30 years ago, there's been that gulf between the Americans and the uh, Asians. America hasn't did anything any different with a martial art import than the other countries did. Uh, I can remember through the history books when Funakoshi went from Okinawa and started the movement in Japan. They didn't call it Okinawa Tei, they called it Japan Way. That's kind of what we've done here. We call it American Karate. Uh, that's what I call it, and I'm very proud of calling it that. Another American Karate expert is Keith Yates, one of Alan Steen's original black belts and president of the Southwest Taekwondo Association. When, when I started the, uh, the Southwest Taekwondo Association back in 76, I, I did it because there were a number of organizations, another number of instructors, I should say, that, that really didn't have any kind of cohesive leadership. Not, not that I can provide that kind of leadership, but I think we needed to have some kind of organization where people could get together and learn some new stuff. Um, in many parts of the country, people kind of float around and they, they don't know who to study from and so forth. Um, I think any credible organization will provide the kind of opportunity for its instructors to get together and learn new techniques. And I think that's what we've tried to do in the Southwest Taekwondo Association. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we do uh, weapons and jiu-jitsu and some of the, the other things at the higher levels. I would encourage any student to broaden their knowledge of the martial art by studying other things. Get videotapes, such as this, this very videotape. Uh, study the techniques. Try to improve your, yourself as a martial artist. And I think martial arts truly will become a way of life for you then. Now whether you begin your new way of life at a traditional Asian dojo, in a modern sport Taekwondo school, or in an Americanized system, you'll start out as a white belt and advance through several colored ranks before reaching the black belt level. 
Now, in most schools, the black belt rank is usually not reached for four or five years, and there's a lot of hard work, tears, sweat, and sometimes even blood. But the promise of reward is great. There is a, a vivid promise of reward. Everybody will take action. So when my grandson came to my house about a year ago, which is 1990, uh, in the springtime, about a year ago, he's five now, when he was four, my grandson Jesse came and home and he said, hi, Grandpa, and then I gave him a little pop like this, hi, my grandson, how are you? Ouch, Grandpa, why you hit me? It's hurt. I said, no, it doesn't hurt. I do that because I love you. I want you to be tough. It doesn't hurt that much. Yes, it hurts, Grandpa. So I took out $20 bills, and Jesse, I want to do one more time. If you, if, you, if, you, if you let me do one more time, I'll give you this toy, this money so you can buy a toy. He goes, go ahead, Grandpa. What this tells, see, whenever the promise of reward is clear, even four-year-old child don't mind going through a little pain. Mm -hmm. So people are lazy because they cannot see the promise of reward. Well, again, and martial art without philosophy is merely street fighting. And therefore, we must base our teaching in martial art, no matter whether you are teaching Jiu-Jitsu, Kendo, Karate, whatever you are teaching, we must organize our thought, that is philosophy. And we've come full circle now, and I myself, like a, like a lot of the uh, people that strictly 90% stress tournament competition, developing champions and winners and tough fighters, I think have recognized that uh, we needed more discipline, courtesy, respect, character building aspects, uh, and uh, I do that now. I stress that, especially with the children, and if I get a tournament uh, competitor along the way, that's fine. In keeping with this emphasis on the character building aspects of the martial arts, Grandmaster Ree believes some of the most important lessons you can learn are the beginning bowing commands, which teach you discipline and respect. The basics in martial art, chariot, which means attention. And see, see, whenever you are given the you know, command, chariot means attention, you st stand straight up and finger straight, neck straight, back straight, everything straight and motionless. And the second uh, most important basics uh, is uh, bowing, saluting, uh, bending your body with, with a, the humble posture, bending and bowing to your instructors and your teachers, and uh, developing the sense of respect. In other words, you're developing sense of undivided attention through charyo, and developing sense of respect through the physiology of bowing. We'll explore more history and martial arts philosophy in the second program of this series. But for now, the remainder of this first program will take you through all the requirements to first gut brown belt, which is the rank just before black belt. We'll start with those bowing commands. There are an estimated 40 million students of the martial arts in America. They study arts as diverse as karate and taekwondo, aikido and judo. Many take up martial arts study because it is the most effective weaponless self-defense there is. Most stick with it because of the benefits of increased discipline, self-confidence, and physical fitness. The Southwest Taekwondo Association presents this black belt training tape for all instructors and students of American martial arts. Although fighting techniques go far back into ancient history, it was the Indian monk, Bodhidharma, who organized the first formal system of martial training. The year was 525 AD. 
From those humble beginnings in the Shaolin Temple in China, the martial arts spread throughout the Asian world. Because communication was slow or even non-existent between countries in those times, each country, in fact each village, formulated its own style of fighting art. In Japan, the samurai developed warrior arts based mostly on the sword. The peasant classes of Okinawa concentrated on empty-handed arts. In Korea, the Warang warriors, a group similar to the samurai, developed an unarmed fighting art over 300 years ago. Korea eventually became less warlike, and the fighting arts declined in popularity, and at one point were actually outlawed and survived only by going underground and being passed along in secrecy. In 1910, Japan overran Korea and instituted martial law. Many Koreans sought better opportunities in China and even in Japan itself. There they were exposed to other fighting arts such as Chinese Kung Fu and Japanese Jiu Jitsu or Karate. The end of World War II brought stability back to the Far East. Korea was liberated from Japanese oppression and thousands came back home to openly practice both the traditional Korean arts as well as the other Asian systems. In 1956, a young third-degree black belt named Jun Ri arrived in Texas and introduced America to the Korean martial arts. He taught a martial arts style called Tang Su Do, or Way of the China Hand. But since no one in this country had ever heard of Tang Su Do, or any of the other Korean martial arts for that matter, Ri used the more well-known Japanese term, Karate. Interestingly, the original translation of Karate was also China Hand, but in order to be more accepted into Japanese society, the translation was changed to empty hand. The other Koreans coming into the United States in the 50s and 60s also continued to use the name karate for their schools. But meanwhile, back in Korea, the various schools decided to unite under a new name, Taekwondo, or way of kicking and punching. The eye had also been set in the minds of most American practitioners, and they continued to use the word karate as a generic term. In fact, many American instructors even use a combination of Japanese and Korean terminology in their classroom, a practice actually quite natural for Americans who tend to combine techniques as well as terminology. And remember, that practice was actually started by the Koreans who came to this country in the 50s and 60s. Students are training for an upcoming karate tournament. Today, tournaments are fun events for the whole family, but it was a different matter back in the early days. Competition was fierce, and injuries were common. There were practically no rules, and certainly not the non-contact rules of today. These early competitors were out to prove that karate was effective, and prove it they did. Pat Burleson won the very first national karate championships ever held in the United States. The year was 1964. The martial arts magazines have called him the grandfather of American sport, karate. You know, it was really very simple why tournament uh, competition was emphasized and stressed back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. I myself, when I opened a karate school back then uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, had a lot of uh, doubtful type potential clients walk through the door. and. Uh, they had to see something that worked. So we put an emphasis on self-defense aspect of it and the competitive part. Uh, I had boxers, cowboys, street fighters, you name it, that walked through the door. And uh, they had to see something that impressed them because they had heard of the mythology of karate, so they wanted to see some hard fact and evidence. And uh, that's basically, in my opinion, how karate gained acceptance and gained respect in the United States because it came over here as something that worked. Myself, I considered coming up in the first wave of uh, black belt uh, tournament competitors in the United States. I uh, was grouped with people like uh, uh, Alan Steen, uh, Mike Stone, and Jim Harrison. In fact, Alan Steen, Mike Stone, and Jim Harrison were known as the Bloody Three. Those guys were just terrible. They hurt everybody they fought. I was kind of the good guy. I could fight with, with uh, in the same ring as those guys, but I didn't quite uh, uh, break the same amount of bones and everything that they did. I kind of adhered a little bit to more. I was a good guy of competition. Those were the terrible three. 
Alan Steen is known as the father of Texas blood and guts karate. He was a feared competitor, winning the 1966 internationals by beating both Joe Lewis and Chuck Norris in a single evening. Mr. Steen also sponsored one of the biggest annual tournaments in the country. We wanted to uh, look at karate as a self-defense and not as an art form. And so competition best served our needs. Uh, and it was fun. I think tournaments are good for the martial arts. As a matter of fact, I think tournaments are what held the martial arts together in this country uh, for the last 30 years. And uh, the main reason tournaments are good, uh, as far as the competition is concerned, is the fact that you get to uh, compete with other students and kind of try out what you've learned, see what works, see what doesn't work. And uh, it's also a goal. You train toward a tournament. Uh, so it keeps you on your toes. There's a different tournament every weekend somewhere. And uh, without tournaments, I believe what we would have would be a, a school knowledge instead of a more eclectic knowledge. I've been asked many times to compare the uh, fighters of the early 60s, which I was a part of, with the modern day fighters, and I don't mind at all giving the modern fighters their due. A, they train harder, their techniques are more sophisticated, they can do things I never could, acrobatic things, and, um, but it's more like boxing in that they can go round after round after round after round. I don't think the fighters of the early 60s could put the protective equipment on and go rounds with the modern fighters and do well. However, putting the modern fighters back in the arena we had with no protection, bare knuckle, and uh, I don't think they could do well back there either. They, it's, it's two different kinds of competition. It was much more rougher and barbaric back there, and there was always that element of uh, getting hurt and getting seriously injured. And that was a, a big psychological factor in throwing punches and kicks. You weighed everything very carefully. You didn't just throw things like a windmill. Everything was, uh, in some cases, uh, you'd go to the hospital, you'd make a wrong move. And that's a different kind of competition. Jun Ri not only introduced America to the Korean martial arts in 1956, but he has been active in the evolution of the martial arts in America. His invention of the foam rubber sparring pads led to the rapid development of sports martial arts. For the first time, competitors could compete in relative safety. But ironically, Grandmaster Reed doesn't approve of the overt emphasis some schools place in the sporting aspects today. He believes that the true spirit of the martial arts lies in its philosophy rather than in just tournaments. I don't know whether uh, the way we are competing, and like for the medals, and we are really losing some great values of martial arts and for the respect for teachers, masters, things like that, has been losing because as soon as they, you know, get the gold medal and, and trophies, they think they are better than teachers and they start losing the respect for the, where they learn from. And so uh, I really feel, uh, I really feel that in a way motivating the children to really work hard is, is good. And on the other hand, we're losing the the great value of a traditional value of a sense of respect for teachers and students. And that's one of the reasons I really uh, personally do not uh, really uh, care about Olympic style. Today's Taekwondo movement that everyone is familiar with through the Olympic exposure, I think is great for the martial arts as a whole to have uh, the public know more about it. I particularly don't appreciate the mythology of competition they use. I think it's uh, uh, not a good way to compete. It uh, isn't a, a very good representation of kick punch because the emphasis is too much on the kicking. But I think overall it's good for public exposure. Olympic Taekwondo, original Taekwondo, American Karate. The world of martial arts seems to be in a constant state of evolution. Even the training patterns or forms have changed several times since Jun Ri came to America in the 1950s. Most of the early Taekwondo stylists learned the Tang Soo Do set of forms that were adapted from Japanese karate. In the early 70s, General Che Hong Hai 
devised a new set of patterns known as the Chunji forms. Most instructors at the time switched to this new set of forms, although some retained some of the older ones in their systems as well. Keith Yates was one of Alan Steen's original black belts and is president of the Southwest Taekwondo Association. When, when Jun Ri first came to this country, he taught a, a style known as Tang Sudo, which was a Korean martial art that he brought over from Korea. It wasn't even called Taekwondo at that time. Now, later on, and this was before my day, they actually changed it uh, to Taekwondo. I came up in a system under an American instructor, under Alan Steen, and we used the term karate. We, we called Taekwondo our style of karate, but we actually used karate as a generic term, which is why in, in many American schools these days, you'll see karate on the window, even though their style may actually be Taekwondo or maybe Kung Fu or something like that. Now, there's, there's been a whole Olympic movement of Taekwondo that you saw in the Olympics recently, and they use a completely different set of forms. And I, I think that came about because of all the political changes over in Korea. General Che was, was basically exiled from Korea for some of the gestures that he made to North Korea, and they actually changed the forms to the Palgays and the Taegooks, which the Olympic style uses. And the kind of forms that, that we do are not those at all. We still use the original forms that uh, General Che came up with with the International Taekwondo Federation. Even though we're not a member of that group, a lot of the American Taekwondo people still use those set of forms. And I've kept some of the other ones, as Mr. Steen did, um, Basai, Chulgi, some of those, and um, we'll demonstrate some of those for you. One of the things that I've tried to do is I've broadened my knowledge of the martial arts is tried to incorporate perhaps some jiu-jitsu, some weapons techniques at the higher levels of black belt. Uh, for instance, uh, Kobudo is the Okinawan art of weaponry, where you use uh, the weapons that you see in the movies now, like nunchucks and size and so forth. And we've incorporated that into our, our higher black belt level requirements, so that every person who's a third or fourth degree black belt has to have more expansive knowledge of the martial art. In, in some schools, a person that's a third degree black belt only knows what a first degree black belt knows, only he's known it longer. In, in our system, at least, what we try to do is, is emphasize a little extra stuff. You have to do forms from other martial arts. You have to do weapons. You have to do jujitsu. And in fact, at, at the very high levels, at fifth and sixth degree black belt, I actually like people to go out and study another martial art long enough to get a black belt in another style. And, and several of our people have done that. I think martial arts is a, is a lifelong study. You can't just study one art for a number of years, quit, and think you're an expert. It's something that you need to do for, for an entire lifetime. And there are so many different martial arts out there that you can study that uh, you would never exhaust the possibilities. So, many schools require more extensive training for the student that has reached first degree black belt. Although first black is considered an expert level by most non-martial artists, it is really only just the beginning, as Grandmaster Ree says. We say when you graduate from high school, it's a commencement. And that means the beginning. When you become first degree black belt, you are now beginning to learn martial arts. And so, uh, after that, you, you become more mature and more your technique becomes sharper and uh, you understand the philosophy not just mission martial art philosophy philosophy and life in general i've tried to maintain the same standards as my instructor we established one of the toughest systems in the country and by that i don't mean just physically tough but comprehensive and i think the quality of our black belts are a tribute to that kind of approach i wanted to build a quality organization and the way to build a quality organization is through tough standards. Our standards were the very highest for every belt and they still are and uh, for a person to be a um, first degree black belt he had to be an example of the goal that most of the students were looking for. They looked at black belt as a goal. Well, if you promoted someone to first degree black belt that wasn't, was less than first degree black belt, you've just lowered your standards. Uh, a first degree black belt is a master, but he's a master of the basics and not of the art itself. 
Most systems consider a fifth degree black belt a master black belt of the art. In the Southwest Taekwondo Association, a person has to be a black belt for at least 11 years before getting fifth degree. And at sixth degree, we let them develop their own system, provided they've already got an earned black belt in more than one art. And don't let anyone tell you that Americans aren't qualified to do that. I think Americans are just as talented in all respects as anyone on earth when it comes to uh, Taekwondo or Karate. And uh, I think anybody can start a style if, the, uh, if it withstands the test of time, it will be a style. As a matter of fact, many people have tried to start their own style in this country, and most of those people uh, have failed. A few of those styles are holding on, but uh, I just don't feel that uh, the Orientals wanted the United States uh, competitors, to, uh, the American competitors, to be uh, masters. Uh, in the first few tournaments in which Americans fought against these Orientals, uh, the Americans dominated. Uh, some people feel like the Americans shouldn't have started an American system. It should have did, should be taught just like it was taught in Korea, just like it was taught in Japan. Well, if that's true, we ought to all still be driving uh, Model A's or riding horses. Everybody's qualified. It's not just Americans or Koreans. Or, it's, it's, we, we are universal human beings. And so whoever feel, again, Ed Parker and Peter Urban, they feel that they have something that you know, they can offer. I mean, everybody has the right to do that. Whether, whether it's going to be accepted or not, it's going to be it remain to be seen. Uh -huh. The public will judge. That's what democracy is good about. Mm -hmm. In Korea, see, nobody was able to really start uh, uh, not, not too many people because of their, their teachers, as long as they are the teachers are living. And they just, uh, you know, uh, is very careful. They are scared. Uh -huh. and, but here, freedom. In other words, people do the way they want. There are probably thousands of different kinds of martial arts styles. Some are a little more than boxing. Some are sport martial arts. Some self-defense oriented. Uh, some are traditional Asian systems. I really believe that a traditional martial arts style should have some kind of philosophy behind it. Uh, I personally like Jun Ri's philosophy for instructors. He has a three-pronged approach. Mind or knowledge, heart or character, and body or, st or power, strength. Uh, Self-confidence starts with knowledge, but knowledge without the character is useless. And character without action is equally useless. So you've got to have all three, knowledge, character, and action. I think that uh, all black belts could teach something like that to their students. Uh, my student creed, which says, to build the true confidence through knowledge in the mind, honesty in the heart, and strength in the body. You have to be powerful and in the punching and kicking. You have to be knowledgeable. The power in martial arts is in punching and kicking. In everyday life here, the power in human society is in knowledge. So you have to know as much as you can. Now, balance. When you kick with one leg, you have only one leg left. You have to develop the sense of balance in, in martial art to become a champion. By the same token, you have to balance your, your, your head and, and, and your, 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 your heart and your, your physical uh, uh, strength. Knowledge in the mind, honesty and strength in the body. So rationale is the key word to corresponding human qualities. Finally, you're flexible. You have to be flexible to be able to kick ahead with, uh, with uh, your kicking. By the same token, you have to be gentle. And you see, whenever you are not flexible, you, uh, you're so rigid, you are not accepted in the society. You have to be gentle and open-minded. And when you are stiff and physically, you're going to die pretty soon. That means you are old and stiff. Your age is near uh, coming to the end. And when you are flexible, so you should be uh, really doing your stretching exercise every day so you can be flexible. And by the same, same token, you have to be flexible in, as, a, as a human character. Be gentle. Lao Tzu put it this way. A man is born gentle and weak. At death, he is hard and stiff. Green plants are tender and filled with sap. 
At this they are withered and dry, therefore, stiff and unbending is disciple of death, and gentle and yielding is a disciple of life. That's a nice way to put it. In the remainder of this second program, we will examine some of the advanced techniques required of black belt instructors in the Southwest Taekwondo Association. You'll see the training patterns that our experts have just spoken about, and you'll be able to study kubudo, or weapons forms as well. We'll also take a look at some jujitsu techniques. So put on your gi, and let's get started. While this video will help you develop your knowledge of katas and self-defense techniques, we feel it is important to point out that a black belt ranking means more than just physical skills. It embodies the whole person. Mind, heart, and body must all work together in a coordinated and mature fashion. We encourage you on your journey in the martial arts. Additional copies of this videotape, as well as copies of the textbook, the complete book of Taekwondo forms, can be ordered directly from the Southwest Taekwondo Association. Junior had transferred up from Southwest State Teachers College, and uh, I'll start again. That bloody three image on my wrapped up. I was, Alan. I was a good guy. <laughs> as well as the other Asian art systems. <laughs> um. 